It is abundantly clear that we live in a world that grapples with new threats to our security. Our cyber capacities have allowed us unlimited opportunities for collaboration, for prosperity, for efficiencies and for building personal and professional networks. They also represent enormous vulnerabilities. The emergence of the non-state actor in the world of terrorist threat represents a particular challenge rarely faced in the past. Non-state actors have the means to exploit and use cyber networks to deliver their deadly agenda. Security agencies have been compelled to react quickly and to develop means to counter these existing and emerging threats. This module will start with an outline of the role of the US National Counterterrorism Center. The NCTC was established after 9-11 to coordinate and facilitate the exchange of valuable intelligence between US agencies in order to prevent any future attacks on the US. To that end, Mr. Ren Gady, the senior legal counsel to the NCTC, will outline the role and capacities of the NCTC as well as its background. The terror attacks of 9-11 prompted the creation of NCTC. If you recall the, the conclusions of the 9-11 Commission report, uh, they concluded that there was lack of uh, interagency coordination and cooperation. Uh, so that forced the creation of the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, our core missions are derived primarily from our founding statute, other laws, um, and intelligence uh, directives. Um, if I can, I'll read our mission statement, and I think that will be a pretty good summary of what we do. I'll go into a little bit of greater detail then. Uh, the mission statement is, lead our nation's effort to combat terrorism at home and abroad by analyzing the threat, sharing that information with our partners, and integrating all instruments of national power to ensure unity of effort. Now what that really means is that on a daily basis, our Joint Operations Center uh, conducts three times a day uh, secure VTCs across the interagency, uh, across the intelligence community to share that information. What that really means is that it operates as a uh, a partnership of organizations, DOD, uh, FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, um, State Department, um, and other agency partners. While a uniquely U.S. agency, many other countries have similar agencies to the NCTC that seek to identify the nature of emerging threats so as to enable a timely response to any attack. Listen to Mr. Gady as he describes the nature of the collection effort and the effect the Snowden disclosures have had on this effort. Well, uh, I've already referred to the 9-11 Commission report, but if you remember the 9-11 Commission report, there was uh, a tremendous amount of information that was out there and the inability uh, of various parts of government to put that information together. So acting on that then, uh, in October 2001, Congress passed uh, the Patriot Act. And the idea behind that was to break down the artificial wall between intelligence and law enforcement. So, writ simple, that's what that's about. Um, now, since then, of course, it's been reauthorized several times. Um, uh, next time we'll come up is in 2015 for reauthorization. We've talked, there are many uh, tools, not just the Patriot Act, um, that we've developed since 9-11. Uh, we've talked a little bit about, about the Patriot Act, um, but as it relates to NCTC, it's important to remember that we are, um, our statutory mission is to serve as the central and shared knowledge bank of all known and suspected terrorists. So Patriot Act is one part of that tool that's shared across uh, various parts of government. Um, it would be derelict of me if I didn't talk a little bit at this time about the current environment. Um, as you know, there have been a number of unauthorized disclosures. And um, the environment that we are in from a, from a counterterrorism perspective is increasingly challenging, partly as a result of unauthorized disclosure from Mr. Stone and, and others. Um, but what we've seen is that um, uh, terrorists are adapting, um, changing their tactics. Uh, to avoid our intelligence collection um, as a result of the leaks and disclosures. Um, they understand better now and they watch very closely uh, to see the scope and scale of not just U.S. collection but generally Western collection efforts. Um, 
and they are changing their capabilities in a way, um, in the way they communicate. Uh, they're adopting encryption technologies, uh, shifting accounts. Most recently with the Paris attacks, you saw that one of the attackers had 13 phones. Um, that's a pretty good example uh, in open source about how the uh, how folks are changing their 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 techniques and their tactics. Uh, all or even worse for us, avoiding uh, electronic uh, communications altogether. Um, so, in areas where we have, in many cases, limited human intelligence collection, uh, the ability to and our our dependence on intercepted communications is incredibly important to our ability to, to uh, identify and disrupt those plots. Um, yeah, going back to the 9-11 Commission report, um, if we, we can't connect the dots unless we can collect the dots. Um, and that's what we're seeing right now is the, the increasing difficulty to collect the dots. The task is not just to identify patterns in behaviour, but to understand the behaviour in the first place. Listen carefully again to Mr Gady as he further explains the work of the NCTC in relation to metadata, and poignantly notes that the issue is not just joining the dots, but also identifying the dots in the first place. Um, well, I think you understand the technical definition of metadata. It's been out in the press. Um, but what we call metadata is otherwise called DRAS, D-R-A-S, and that's the dialing, routing, and signaling information. Uh, it does not involve the content, the substance, the purpose of that information uh, whatsoever. Um, so as it relates to NCTC, NCTC is an aggregator of data, aggregator of information. So when we pull that data, we, we get that data from elsewhere, from other agencies, the same protections that were applicable to those agencies are applicable to us. So whether it's you know by statute, court orders, uh, internal regulations, um, oversight from Congress, the courts, that is all applicable to us from the originating source. Um, well, it's, a, it's one of the tools you rely on. Um, remember my last comment about connecting the dots, you have to collect the dots. Those are some of the dots that you have available in the universe of information, is that metadata. Finally, while a compelling case can be made for government agencies to have the capacity to collect data relevant to emerging or actual threats to national security, it is important to keep in mind the need for public trust in this activity. The collection of information that can have personal implications necessarily raises a level of anxiety in rational thinking people. Listen then, as Mr Gady discusses this issue and speaks to the recognition of agencies like the NCTC to these values. Well, let me start by saying that NCDC doesn't have any interest in what grandma says on the phone. None. The thought that NCTC um, or other interagency partners have an interest in what grandma says on the phone, what she purchases, what the book she reads is absolutely preposterous. Um, but your question isn't directed necessarily at NCTC. It's directed at the U.S. government in general. And since those unauthorized disclosures, we've had many of those questions. Um, and if you can put that, the answer in kind of a historical analysis, I think it's useful. If you take a look at privacy, nobody talked about the right to privacy until the end of the 19th century. Uh, you know this probably, but um, it wasn't until uh, 1890 article uh, that um, Louis Brandeis, later Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, talked about the right to privacy. Previously, the right to privacy was thought about, you know, with you know peeping toms or you know something like that. But technology brought about uh, changes, and he addressed that in his 1890 article, talking about that. And it was addressed to technology of the day, photographs and newspapers. Today, citizens around the globe put troves of data um, out there for public consumption, whether it's by way of e-commerce, uh, social media, whatever it might be. Uh, we put that out there willingly. That's the way we do business, if you would, these days. Now we conduct our personal lives. Government access to that same information causes concern for good reason. 
um, because of what the government, whatever government, can do to us. Um, a, a little bit of a digression here. As it relates to um, you know, the Snowden disclosures, uh, nowhere in there um, is it to be found that there were any violations of law. Nowhere. These are not the FBI abuses, you know, the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation abuses of the 60s and 70s. Nowhere out there are there violations of law. So put that in context. <clears throat> I think the President um, last year, a little bit over a year ago now, um, issued Presidential Policy Directive 28. Um, and PPD 28 looks to address some of these fundamental concerns we have of privacy in the private sector, privacy in, in government as well. And the intent behind PPD 28 was to assure not only U.S. citizens, but people across the world uh, of how data is handled, particularly in that case, signals intelligence. So um, one last thing I might point to is since those disclosures, there's been a concerted effort for greater transparency across um, the U.S. government and across the intelligence community. I think that's true not only from a uh, U.S. perspective, but um, uh, many of our partners as well. And those should be efforts um, in a really diverse, complex, uh, and in many cases violent world where you're trying to balance privacy and protection. Um, that's what we try to do every day.